Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Elvin Taylor. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. The next hour is devoted to learning something more, not just about the world of shoes and ships and sealing wax, but about how, what, and why we believe as we do. A time for the open-minded and a time for those willing to question what they think they know or what they may believe, those willing to be uncertain for an hour. I'm Eldon Taylor, and this is Provocative Enlightenment. All right, our chat room is open, and my partner, Ravinder, awaits you there now. You can log on by going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. We do have a wonderful chat room. Uh, I enjoy reading your chat, usually in the archives following the show. So tell us all about it, Ravinder. Yes, uh, we do have a great chat room, a great group of people. Lots of important information gets shared in there. You know, there are times we're just talking amongst ourselves, um, but there's also times when we're posting information, you know, URLs and links and whatever that the guest is talking about. So we post it all there. And if you cannot come in live, um, as Eldon was saying, if you go to our archives, you can always access the chat log for that particular show. So do come join us if you can. That is provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. All right. In this week's spotlight, I wish to address something we all hear a lot about today, and that's the idea of fake news. Now, I'm not going to go down the road of Trumpian fake news, so relax if that concerns you. No, I'm more interested in bringing to your attention how the media could rush to judgment in ways that divide our country and contaminate our thinking about matters outside of the world of politics. We hear a lot today about the evils of Google, as this past weekend 60 Minutes show argued, or the Facebook scandal and their involvement with Cambridge Analytica, and these stories are important. What we don't hear much about is the good things that occur every day. Moreover, since it seems that most folks want to hear the sensational, or so the ratings would suggest, when a story is sensational, it is repeated everywhere and becomes a meme of our culture as a result. Think about the meme, I can see Russia from my kitchen. This is a narrative that many people still believe Sarah Palin actually said. Unfortunately, the research data shows us that even when a person is informed that the information they hold as true has been recanted and is totally false, folks tend to remember the original piece and where they saw or heard the information and keep right on repeating it. In other words, a retraction run in the newspaper where you read the original article is totally insufficient to change your mind if you agreed or wanted to believe what you read in the first place. Okay, we've all heard a lot in the news during the past couple of years about police shootings, and much of what we have heard is fiction. For example, as Jim Comey so aptly points out in his book, A Higher Loyalty, the press reported the shooting of the young black American Michael Brown, who was shot and killed by a white officer in Ferguson, Missouri on August 9th of 2014. This incident touched off weeks of rioting and unrest in the community. The press reported that some 25 businesses burned down, including Walgreens, Little Caesars, O'Reilly's Auto Parts, Auto by Credit, Beauty World, Sam's Meat Market, AutoZone, Public Storage, AC Wireless, and then many more. Two police cruisers were burned out. One person died and many more were injured. The total cost of the riot in dollars, according to Hoosier Econ, was $5.7 million for the first riot alone, and there were more riots to follow. The DOJ spent months investigating the case and determined that the media accounts were factually wrong and misleading. Quoting Comey, contrary to what most people of the public heard or thought they had seen, there was reliable evidence that Michael Brown 
was not surrendering when he was shot. And there was DNA evidence that he had assaulted the officer and tried to take his gun. Close quote. Unfortunately, by the time the facts were released, the damage was done. The hands up, don't shoot story repeated over and over in the media, dramatized by members of Congress, shared in posts on social media platforms, repeated on posters held high by protesters, etc., etc., had become a meme. You can think of this meme as a Hollywood meme like, go ahead and make my day. It is a total fiction. Now as a bit of an aside, even if retractions generally fail at convincing those who wish to believe otherwise, if you posted this meme and then learned that it was false but failed to retract or correct your post, then you're as guilty of spreading divisive lies as anyone. Sorry, that may be very blunt, but it's absolutely true. It disturbs me and should disturb every thinking person that a fictional narrative can be the basis for violence, that a pure fiction can lead to so much distrust that we forget to value the men and women who regularly put their lives on the line to protect each of us. Those are my thoughts anyway. What are yours, Ravinder? You know, that's an interesting point there. You know, the aspect where you know where you're talking about um, if someone if it, if some information is reported that is false and then they post a retraction it doesn't make any difference to the opinion of the reader uh, but then you go on to say that you know if you've shared some of that stuff then you should post the retraction yourself and the important thing there that I think is it changes you I mean if you take the time and the energy to say, oh, my understanding of that story was wrong, I posted information about that, I need to correct it, then it will make a difference to you and it gives you the ability to make better judgments in the future, you know, because you've got a much better base of information for yourself that that has actually gone in. It actually makes a difference. I totally agree. It's all about integrity and character. Yeah, but, you know, it just helps you. I mean... We all have biases, um, but the more you become aware of your own biases and the more you work to get rid of those biases, well, you're in a much better position then to provide real information and make real decisions about everything that, that is going on. I think it's better for the, for the country if everyone takes that kind of self-responsibility. Totally concur. Okay, every week I read some of your letters as our way of involving you while paying respect to the very important role you play in making this show successful. Last week our show featured Hillary Gamm, and we discussed her book, Billions Lost, The American Tech Crisis and the Roadmap to Change. Thomas wrote, what a great guest. Gamm hit it out of the park. Technology is our future, and if we don't wake up to what we're doing by outsourcing so much of it, she's absolutely right. We'll end up a service country and servicing our own inventions for the benefit of countries like China. Elizabeth wrote, I just finished reading your book, Gotcha, and Gam's book, Billions Lost. You two should absolutely collaborate, and everyone should read your books. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. Anonymous wrote, you're an American patriot looking out for the welfare and best interest of every human being who comes into your sphere of influence. You inspire me. And I wish you all good things as you continue to educate and enlighten your lucky listeners. CB wrote, well, that was fast and furious. The guest was very articulate. And, of course, the topic certainly dives deep on topics explored by Gotcha. Guess I have a book to get. I see cases all the time that refer to criminal conversations and text and locations of phones during the time of crimes used as evidence all the time. Laws are opening up the black box computers on cars, too. Information that can let insurance companies off the hook for full coverage. Famous curse, may you live in interesting times. Well, thank you, CB, for your comments. Moving on, Lauren wrote, I love your products. Lisa wrote, thank you so much for your Intertalk CDs. I have used Freedom from Sugar for a couple of months now, and I have not touched any sweets nor have I even thought about desserts or sugary foods in a while. Not even during PMS. I also have used Enhancing Romance CD, 
and I have begun to go out on dates and keep meeting nice young men who ask me out. My life has really changed since I began using these CDs on a daily basis. Thank you. Well, thank you, Lisa, and thank all of you. We appreciate your letters, so do please keep them coming. You can do that. You can opine by writing to me at Eldon, that's E-L-D-O-N, at EldonTaylor.com, or by joining me on Facebook at Dr. Eldon Taylor. All right, now to today's show. Shots fired, the misunderstandings, misconceptions, and myths about police shootings, a book I think every American should read, with the author Joseph Laughlin. So let me tell you a little about today's guest. Joseph K. Laughlin is a former assistant chief of police for the city of Portland, Maine. He served as the interim chief in 2008 and retired from service in 2010 after 30 years of police work. He has the historic distinction of achieving and serving in every single sworn rank within the Portland Police Department. He is one of the original founders of the police peer support team and employee assistant network. He has served as the commander of the special reaction team and was a team member for over 20 years. He was a spokesperson for the department as the detective lieutenant in charge of the criminal investigation division which he considers a highlight of his career. He's a graduate of the FBI National Command Training in Quantico, Virginia, and he holds a master's degree from University of Southern Maine. All right, on that, let's get him in here. Welcome to Provocative Enlightenment, Mr. Joseph Laughlin. Hello, good afternoon. It's good to have you join us, sir. On this Thank show, we like to know three things. Who is the messenger? What is the message? And how do we use it? So to that end, let's let's begin with share with us what drives your passions and goals. Well, um, I, I believe uh, police work is a calling, uh, and I inadvertently got involved. I had no desire to become a police officer initially when I was a young, liberal-minded man. Um, but during my career, after I got exposed to to the humanity and all the difficulties that officers face, I became impassioned with educating people about the realities of police work. So I started writing for the local paper um, of what you may have heard and what the realities are and what really happened, contrary to what's often portrayed in the media. So that's uh, something that became near and dear to my heart. My first book was Finding Amy, uh, and that is about a missing woman. It was Kate Clark Flora, by the way, who was my co-author, and she's written 19 books. But uh, Finding Amy uh, describes the emotions and the attachment that uh, officers and detectives have with their victims and, you know, that we're human, too, and, and how difficult these matters are for us and the emotional toll it takes on us. The, uh, the, the book, Shots Fired, I mean, if you're ready to go into that, I, I can, but I can't remember the last question. Well, let, let's start here, Joe. Let's, you know, um, I want to get into your book, and I want to get into it in depth. And, and I do believe it is a book that every American should read, because I, I know law enforcement is just totally misunderstood. You know, we have all kinds of Hollywood ideas, and, and I know that you know that, because I've read your book. Um, oh, thank you. You heard today's Spotlight. What have I got wrong? Well, you're you're dead on. It's 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 accurate, and I think we've reached critical mass in this country, and the polarization, uh, and the dehumanization of uh, police officers uh, is, is counterintuitive. Number one, and it affects our society. But what you both described is how bits and pieces of information will go out. A sensational information without the facts, without the circumstances, without the contours of the events, without the human dynamics, the forensics, the physics, and all those other things that are attendant to these, you know, horrible situations. And they play the same videos over and over and over again to get into the American psyche. Um, and it's done tremendous damage to our society. In fact, you mentioned Comey uh, in, I think it was 20. 2016 when he got in front of the International Association of Chiefs of Police and described a chill wind blowing through law enforcement uh, and how uh, you know we were dramatically affected by starting by the Michael Brown incident and then a series of other you know constant pernicious and pervasive rhetoric against the police again without any facts without any real information uh, and you know who's so uh, society suffers the most uh, because it has a pronounced effect on our guardians, 
Um, and it's very difficult to work uh, in a world where you're trying to survive emotionally and physically every day and mentally every day, and you're constantly being attacked uh, and ridiculed and painted as you know, racist and evil and incompetent, and it's just simply not true. But what you expressed about the media was very, very accurate. And you can't impute all the media, but boy, you know, it, a lot of stuff goes out there without any information, starting with Michael Brown, which never actually happened, you know? And no kidding. And I, look, you, you brought up a couple of subjects. I'm going to take you pretty deep here, and, and I hope you can be candid with me, but I respect if you, I mean, I respect you if for whatever reason you're uncomfortable with this idea, but, uh, you know, question. Let me try something out on you before we sure. get fully into your book. Implied in much of what I read and have learned, uh, including from law enforcement, it would appear that there is some reluctance on behalf of law enforcement to enter some black communities where the citizens spit, throw rocks at officers, and so forth, where perhaps a fatal shooting may occur that involves a black due to the very nature of how these incidents might evolve. Uh, and they might become the focus of racial riots where officers may be besmirched and vilified, even sued individually despite being cleared of wrong uh, doings or have their careers ended, their families shamed, and so on. So we know about the increase in, say, black-on-black -black crime in some areas. And as Comey said, and as some police chiefs are talking, there seems to be a change in policing policies. Is it possible that because of this backlash, because of everything that's involved, that there's any traction to the idea that these these communities are really injuring themselves because law enforcement is pulling back at all, Joe. You know, you you, you touched upon a lot of things there, but you're really expressing the Ferguson effect, the so-called Ferguson effect, which was first identified by Heather McDonald, who described um, how uh, police are portrayed as racist and bigoted, you know, group of commodities. Um, and how they were doing de-policing uh, after 2014. Now, I know I've talked to commanders all over the country. I'm intimately involved. I still teach. Uh, police are very, very resilient individuals, and we have to find a way to move on beyond all the, the rhetoric. Uh, but there's no doubt in my mind, and it's illustrated, especially in Chicago, Baltimore, and other major cities, uh, where the crime rate and the homicide rate went up in some cases 20 percent and that's a direct result of of cops not being aggressive in a proactive manner now they all respond we all respond to the 911 calls and uh, you know you look for problems in your area but there was no doubt in my mind and it was illustrated by the by the results that neighborhoods got more dangerous there were more killings uh, there were more race on race killings than, than ever before, especially in 16, 2015, 16, 17. Like I said, it went up, um, but there's no doubt that happened. Now we're starting to see a little bit of a turnaround, especially in Chicago. And that is because officers are starting to become proactive again. And I can tell you my own experiences because we had the Department of Justice come into my department because we were accused of being uh, racist and brutal and you know, after the, the research and everything, they found nothing. And in fact, after I left, we had a, a, a black chief, James Craig, who also determined that, you know, th this is a fine police department, which by and large is the vast majority, and it's not racist. But to your point, yes, there's no doubt that we had an impact on our society, and the good people in these neighborhoods suffer. Uh, the other way uh, this works is, you know, Heather McDonald has done a lot of research, and I have too, is that you may have an entire uh, uh, African-American neighborhood and one area where the police are there all the time. So they're not dealing with anyone else but African-Americans. Um, and people know the police and the police know the people. Uh, but if there's a shooting, for instance, here's, this is a good one. If there's a shooting, police flood the area because they know there's going to be a retaliatory shooting. So when they flood the area, they're going to stop a lot of people. Uh, stop and frisk, ask questions, try and determine. And the reason they're doing that is because there's going to be a retaliatory shooting. Some grandmother, some kid, 
some mom is going to get drive-by shooting and get an innocent is going to get uh, hurt in these actions. So they document all of their uh, interactions, which, by the way, are all are blacks, all African Americans. And then all of a sudden, you know, when you look at statistics, the police get accused of being racist because they stopped too many African Americans. That's one type of example. But, right. You know, we and I to want to get into those. I'm sorry. Go on. I don't want to cut you off. Well, I mean, I can talk forever on this. We have to get back to seeing each other. New York City is starting to do an exemplary job uh, in really identifying, okay, here's where the problems are coming from, and also communicating with the communities. And now the communities are getting together and saying, you know, okay, we agree with you. We are having problems. We are having homicides. We are having aggravated assaults in these particular communities. So therefore, we need the police, and the police will be there more than they would be in other communities. But it's been so twisted around by the media that it's, you know, in my view, it's obscene what's happened to the the, the culture has been destroyed on a lot. Uh, police culture and the police uh, profession has been destroyed on a lot of levels. I think, you know, I'm going to put something else by you here just as, you know, I, I think there's another cost factor in addition to those that you, you discussed or implied in my question. You mentioned Baltimore. So on the 20th, I guess that was Monday, uh, we had a female officer killed, killed by a 16-year-old black. Um, I'm not sure of the facts, and they're not all out, and it's still under investigation. So I'm just going to set this up as a hypothetical based on um, what we think we understand at this point in time. May not go down this way, but as a hypothetical, I'm going to ask you to answer this question. Female officer steps out in front of a black Jeep, uh, leaving a scene of what apparently was a burglary. She's been called there due to the burglary. Black 16-year-old behind the wheel. She pulls her weapon, yells stop at him. The 16-year-old hits the gas, runs her down, and kills her. Okay. Question. How much, knowing inside, what an officer would go through if this woman had pulled the trigger and killed that 16-year-old rather than die, how much hesitation might be added to that officer's response, placing them in additional jeopardy? Um, there is hesitation, uh, and in fact, that is illustrated by the thousands, which I, I know you probably haven't heard this and nobody does, the thousands of officers that are shot uh, and stabbed uh, each year and cut uh, and are in wheelchairs and breathing tubes and blind and crippled that no one ever hears about, much like our veterans. And a lot of those cases, they're, they're hesitated because, you know, the, the, the thinking is the, the thinking that an officer wants to be engaged in a deadly force incident is so counterintuitive and so opposite of what we all believe in uh, is that. The notion that cops want to be involved in this thing is, is crazy because you're going to be painted, uh, uh, you know, as incompetent, racist, evil on the front page the next day. So there, I don't know what happened in these circumstances, but you're absolutely right. If it was the other way around, it would be played over and over again with no information about what happened, no investigation. It would be all over social media where the cops did it again. I've had to listen to my friends and people and family talk about how the police are out of control and there is an epidemic of police shootings and they're hunting a segment of our population. It's simply not the case. And we just thought we need to have some kind of, uh, I guess, emotional conduit to start talking to each other again. And what's happening to cops today and the profession is what happened to our veterans that came back from the Vietnam War in Southeast Asia, where they were all portrayed as killers and baby killers and people were spitting at them and throwing things at them and throwing blood at them. Ten years later after that, society recognized what happened and said, well, sorry, well, too late. This is what's happening to the police profession today. And, you know, people are suffering. The, the communities are suffering by not getting good policing. And numbers are down. Dallas, for instance, was down 500 people. My police department is down 25, 30 people. The job can't be done proactively when those things happen. But again, back to the original uh, question, I don't know what was in the officer's mind. That certainly could be the case. And that'll be determined by forensics and, and thorough investigation. 
You know, I hate to admit this, uh, Joe, but I was a lie detection examiner for many, many years, and I encouraged my son to enter the Bureau and uh, wow. become involved with the BAU and uh, know some people there, and we set up a great meeting for him um, with the chair of the department at Seattle University, one of the few DOJ-approved uh, schools of its kind, and when that Texas... Uh, Shooting went down when those officers were ambushed. I was in a hotel with him, and we saw it on television. We were making it, and I said to him, you know, hey, look, I don't think you should go into law enforcement. Let's talk about another career. And and in part, you know, I'm embarrassed to admit that. Um, But on the other hand, it's, uh, you know, that's got to influence a lot of people today that might otherwise be there in service. Uh, to protect and serve us as a public, and, and that is another real cost. We have a break. When we get back, we'll pick this back up. We're speaking with Joseph Laughlin about his work and book, Shots Fired. You can learn more about our guest by visiting his website at shotsfiredbook.com. Now we have a video for you today featuring uh, the story of one officer who was shot 15 times while preventing a massacre in a Sikh temple. He miraculously survived and shares what happened in this video. It is a moving video, so if you're not already in the chat room, now's the time to get on over there, and you can do that again by going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. We'll be right back. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment with Elton Taylor. Change has never been easier. Whether you wish to lose weight, stop smoking, build better relationships, become creative, enjoy ultra prosperity, or simply relax and promote self-healing, InnerTalk has been repeatedly demonstrated effective in the most rigorous of scientific studies. Our customers love InnerTalk. Sean wrote, I have struggled with bulimia for over 30 years and have never been able to lose weight without restoring to it until I used InnerTalk. Vicki wrote, My hubby has been using the Stop Snoring CD and already his dangerous and raucous snoring levels have stopped. Celeste wrote, I recently graduated from Taft Law School with honors. I'm writing to tell you how much your inner talk CD, Excel in Exams, has helped me. With over 300 titles to choose from, there is something for everyone. Check it out today by going to innertalk.com. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Alvin Taylor. If you've just joined us, we're chatting with Joseph Laughlin about his work and book, Shots Fired. You can learn more about our guest by visiting his website at Shots Fired Book, as one word, shotsfiredbook.com. Now, we ask our guests for their favorite music, music that has some true significance to them. Music psychology is a field of research with practical relevance in many areas, including intelligence, creativity, personality, and social behavior. So, Joe, we just played some of Yellow by Coldplay. Why is this music important to you, and how does it inform us about who you are? Well, I, I guess um, I'm impassioned by what I do and, and how I feel that I affect humanity in a, in a positive way as best I can throughout my career. And, um, you know, Yellow by Coldplay way back when, I, th- I think it's a song, even though he wrote it for his girlfriend, that's my understanding of it. It's a song that we can sing to all of us. You know, uh, look how the stars shine for you for all that we do and, and all that good people try to do um, in this world to assist others and, and uh, make it a better place. That's something that touched me a long time ago. Excellent. Let me... Uh... There's some things, I guess, that you, you kind of know, and so you forget about fleshing them out. But I think one of the things that our audience should know right away is uh, you know, there are a lot of fictions about what's involved uh, 
uh, in police work. Um, a lot of people don't think about law enforcement's role in social services, uh, the homeless, uh, you know, child abuse, and, you know, and, and, and other roles that they play. But I think most significantly in the context of what we're talking about, um, and, and as you draw it in your book, you watch um, a movie on television, the officer, you know, shoots the perpetrator and then runs right back to you know, investigate another case and or to pursue somebody else. And that's not at all what happens. So tell our audience, what's involved when a police officer is involved in a shooting? Well, first, I'll start off by expressing that, and you touched upon it is that people have very little realistic, if any, information about what we do on a day-to-day basis. I mean, it almost really shouldn't be called law enforcement anymore because we find ourselves negotiating from extremely complex, difficult human situations uh, that are punctuated by violence on a day-to-day basis, and most times with no good answers. Uh, 70% of our time and an inordinate amount of time is, is uh, dealing with uh, people and shuffling them through the myriad of social service systems that are broken. And it's the officer left holding the bag at 2, 3 in the morning, 4 in the afternoon, whatever it is. The mentally ill, the homeless, the drug, the deranged, the desperate, and all the attendant horrible, horrific crimes that come with it. It takes a toll on, on your emotions. And people will say that, you know, you guys put your life on, on the line, you guys and gals. But where you really put your life on the line is emotionally, uh, psychologically, and mentally in your soul. Um, And that's where it really profoundly affects you, and you have to find a way to negotiate through that world. But uh, as I said, police are a resilient uh, type of individual, and you have to believe in it. I'm not saying all do, but um, most do. To answer your question in regard to deadly force, you know, people are trained by TV, movies, video games, and it's just not simply true. Uh, These events are, number one, piercingly painful, bewildering to the officer after it just happens, uh, and nobody wants to be involved in something like that. It has a pronounced effect on them for the rest of their life. They have to live with the fact that they've killed a human being. Uh, and other officers see what goes on with these officers who have been involved and say, I want no part of that. They go through multiple protracted, uh, intense investigations within the police department by force teams, internal affairs, and outside the police department, from everybody from the Department of Justice to, to the FBI to obviously the attorneys general uh, to the district attorney. Uh, and you're removed from your cohorts and, uh, you know, your family. It's a, a lot of police officers have extremely difficult reactions uh, and traumatic reactions to these events. And that is illustrated in the book over and over again. I know I'm talking a lot, but during my interviews, these are direct interviews with officers who've had to use deadly force. Going back in time, you know, even 20 years ago, and all of them, uh, almost to a man and woman, I'd had to stop the tape because they had they were getting emotional, they were crying, they couldn't continue. I've had dozens and dozens walk away that couldn't handle uh, being in this book because of that very reason. So it's not TV. Real life is grotesque, disturbing, uh, and it's final. And there are no good outcomes for the families of the deceased, for the communities, and for the police officers for their families, for their friends, for their kids, for uh, the, the, uh, the police department organization itself. It's just not a good thing. You know, TV will have you seen, you know, watch some episodes where cops kill people all the time. And I go, this is ridiculous. But that's what people believe. It's not like that in real life. Right, right, right. You know, I think another distortion that exists out there has to do with data, statistics. Um, I've actually had a confrontation with my older son about this uh, because, you know, it's very easy for people to parrot the words of some pundit from television who has his own agenda. But you discuss the data, and and, and I'm just going to quote part of what you've got here uh, and then ask you to flesh out more for us. But... Uh, Quote, to further put this into context, police made 11,205,833 criminal arrests, 
charges according to the FBI Uniform Crime Reports. Out of these 11,205,833 arrest charges, officers were assaulted roughly 48,315 times. But only 990 deaths of citizens occurred. Now, they're assaulted with a, with a weapon, something that could have killed the officer. I continue to quote. These deaths occurred in only 0.0003% of all police citizen contacts. Only 0.009% of all arrest situations and only in 2.1% of situations with assault on officer. Is that the data that you hear in the media, Joe? No, you don't hear any realistic information in the media. It's all sensationalized. And again, the same videos, even going all the way back to Rodney King, which the full story has never come down on that as well, is played over and over again. Now, you know, with the African-American community, you have to look through things through a historic lens and, you know, the hyperbole and the emotions that go along with it. But there are a lot of people that are inciting and disrupting and causing problems in those communities and exacerbating uh, belief systems. Uh, I think it's starting to turn around a little bit, but first of all, it's far less than 5% of any officers during their entire career to be involved in in any uh, deadly weapon uh, shooting or any shooting, any type of shooting at all, self-included. Most police officers, the vast majority go through their entire careers without ever using their weapon. Um, again, now the assaults in general terms, there's 60,000 plus to 70,000 assaults on officers for e- per year. That was a different year that I, that I took out in 2015. Um, and again, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of officers that are shot and survive. Uh, and then you go on to the population that we have in this country, 325 million people and 11 million more that we you know, don't know about whatever you know, is in the mix. Right. So the chances of anyone getting uh, black, white, green, or yellow getting killed by the police is, is extremely, I, I don't want to use the word rare because people don't like that. Um, people don't like statistics either. Um, but the facts are the facts. Uh, and the, the, our society is very confused. And I've talked to extremely bright, well-educated people, uh, especially our young people all over the country. And, and the um, you know, the idea they have about police is just, uh, it's, it's not, it's not accurate. It's, it's wrong. Uh, and we need to develop some kind of emotional conduit to, to, to get back to better conversations about the humanity behind the shield. Uh, and it, it's interesting because a lot of, you know, my girlfriends over the years, friends would meet my coworkers and say, wow, they're, they're such great people. I didn't know that they were so nice. And, they raise all that money for that kid or, uh, you know, the thousands, tens of thousands of good acts that occur every day in this country that no one will hear about. Uh, there, yeah, there's a lot in the mix. We don't see those stories. And, yeah. uh, and, and, I, and I think that's just totally unfortunate. And that's probably why I, I'm so adamant about endorsing your book, Shots, uh, Shots hey. Fired. Uh, it, it is a story that, you know, that tells it the way it is, and people need to grasp these things with some sense of reality, as opposed to let it be framed by all of this misinformation, and sometimes I think just deliberately, um, I, I probably shouldn't say that, I, I'll back up for a minute, and let me do this, let's take on another one of the controversies that you hear about in our informed media. Um, Why guns at all? Why not, you know, tasers? Why not something less lethal? I mean, what what do we, you know, and and why so many shots? How come you have to shoot somebody 20 times? What is that all about? Clearly, the police are just over the top. Give us the truth there, Joe. You know, that's I'm, I'm kind of smiling because you'll hear, you know, why didn't the police use less, le- less lethal? Why didn't they just talk them down? Why didn't they de-escalate? 
which is the new buzzword now. By the way, uh, we've been using de-escalation as long as I know. We just call it calming people down and bringing them to a level where we can work with them. Right. You know, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's a new buzzword. But first of all, there are 34,000 at least physical arrests a day with extremely violent people, many violent people. And every woman out there will know in a violent domestic when the guy is picking up refrigerators or putting his head through the window or, you know, swinging a hatchet around. You know, we go to those things all the time. That is a constant routine call. And we take people into custody with less lethal means every single day. Pepper mace, batons, beanbag rounds, tasers. Uh, the last thing we want to do is go hands-on, and I'll tell you why, because the likelihood of you getting injured is very good, and the person will get injured as well. Uh, a taser is used every two minutes in this country, in Canada, every single day. Pepper mace is used like, like water. Uh, so there are a lot of violent people that are taken into custody every single day. And again, officers are assaulted with a weapon every day in this country, 27 to 40 times a day. So... We do take people into uh, custody by less lethal. We do de-escalate every single day. Most of the calls we go to, that's what you do. And I'll tell you why. It's a great feeling to go so to something that's terrifying, rapidly evolving. You know people are going to get hurt. And to resolve that and take people into custody um, safely and get everybody, including the suspect, you know, to where they belong, whether it's jail or the hospital, uh, in, in a safe manner. And oftentimes you're stunned at what you see and you look at each other when it's done. You go, how do we get through that? Then there's the rarity, uh, which is an operative word, of police use of deadly force. But that's all you'll see over and over and over again. And in my view, you touched upon it. I think there was a deliberate action politically and, and with a lot of irresponsible people to demonize and dehumanize the police uh, in this nation, and they've done tremendous damage to our society, and we have a very confused public. The, I'll, I'll answer the next question when you're ready. I don't want to keep talking. No, it's, uh, you know, I hesitated to go down that route, but uh, since you opened it up, I'm going to back up a little bit, and, uh, you know, I kind of believe that one of the problems not not that it's an easy solvable problem it has to do with how we categorize people you know uh, we don't think about people in our country as americans rather we have distinctions like black lives and blue lives and i think that anytime we begin to separate people by category we also infer many implications that only serve to divide us so i believe that you know these categories that incorporate stereotypical implications and thereby increase bias or at least make us aware of bias should ought to be done away with. I don't know how practical an idea that is, but given that kind of a, a foundation, I, I think back to a Harvard professor entering his home. He hasn't got his keys. He hasn't got any identification on it. He's breaking into the house. Uh, an officer um, diligently sees this intruder breaking into a home, uh, stops him with no ID, etc., arrests him. And it's a major story everywhere, and we have condemnation of the police immediately. And in my mind, there was the seed to a lot of of the furor that's going on right now. Do you, do you, I know I'm at risk politically when I say that, but Joe, what do you think? You Yeah, I, st I stay out of politics, but when I first saw that, I've probably done that dozens and dozens of times. You don't know who you're dealing with. You get phone calls from the public saying that, hey, we think there's a guy breaking into the house. You don't know what's going on. You don't know who's who. You don't know if they're on PCP, crack, whatever. Uh, so you have to, to be circumspect when you approach these things. But that was a tipping point. And, and, you know, again, politics, you know, when you start talking about the police acted stupidly over this minor thing where this, this arrogant person, you know, also demonized the police and politicized everything, that was, uh, that was one of the fuses. And then it goes on from there. 
uh, and it, it's the damage that was done to the profession and to our society uh, is pronounced, and we're suffering consequences now from that. Um, and I think it, you know, it gave license. I mean, correct me if you disagree. It gave with me, but I think it gave license to the whole idea that, you know, well, we can go after law enforcement now. Look, they're clearly racist. I mean, this wouldn't have happened if it was a white guy at the door. That's crazy. Let me, let me tell you something. That cop, uh, cops. You talk about implicit bias. We all have implicit bias and everything. But you get so much human experience by the time you're on in a couple of years by dealing with people in crisis all the time in terrible, frightening situations that you don't care if people are green. You know, cops don't care if black, white or green or yellow. I'm not saying that there aren't bad cops. I'm not saying that there aren't horrible mistakes or poor tactics that lead to something because I work with some of those cops. But by and large, you're looking at behavior. You're looking at people. And you'll take a minor little case like that and blow it up nationwide. You know, the other thing that just came to my mind is, uh, you remember the, the subway cop the years ago, they had this police officer kneeling down and giving a homeless person a pair of boots. Yeah. And it was, it was ubiquitous. It was all over the news with everybody, you know, heralding, why can't we have more police officers like that? Why don't police? Well, we do that all the time. I've done things like that. Hundreds of times we use our own. There are so many good acts that occur in our communities every day with black, white, green, pink or yellow people. It doesn't matter. You know, we care about the humanity of our neighborhoods. You get attached to your neighborhood. You want to make uh, it a good, safe place. So that is another illustration. There are, there are tens of thousands of good acts that occur every single day that you'll never hear about. But, yes, it became a political thing. And and I think people have been. Uh, twisted into a, a, a very misinformed view of police. And again, it goes back to like what happened to the kids that came back from Vietnam. And uh, that's what's happening right now in this country. That's what I think. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I had friends come home, spit on in their uniform as they landed in the airport or walked into half. You know. uh, look, we're, there's so many more questions I'd like love to ask you, but I'm going to have to go quick now because we're down to just a few minutes. In your view, Joe, are body cameras a good solution? Yes, and and I'll tell you why, but they have limitations. You know, this is another misnomer is that police are are afraid of cameras, and it's quite contrary uh, to to that. Uh, In fact, in my department, we used uh, uh, in-car video for years, and so many times it sided with the police, you know, where people call my client was arrested and physically abused. And I go, well, let's look at the videotape. It changes the dynamic. What people have to realize with body cameras, first of all, these are these are complex undertakings to take inside the police department to download the information, what's private, what's public. And cameras by nature are only two dimensional. They're not 360 like with all our hearing and all our attendant senses. Let's use a football game for an example. In a football game, there are nine cameras trying to determine what happened. Did the ball touch the ground? Was a guy knee? Was a guy knee down? And there are people present specifically looking for these things, and they can't even determine. They got to use cameras. So when you see something on TV or uh, you know uh, on social media with a, a video, you're only getting part of the information. And you're not getting the totality of circumstances or the attendant human dynamics and human equation behind it Uh, and forensics and physics. And, you know, critics of the police conveniently ignore all these other attendant circumstances. But cameras are good. Cops embrace it. But it's a monster to take on in an organization with all competing needs and, you know, downloading and the cost. And, you know, you need a whole division to run these things. It's it's uh, just difficult. And again, the manpower person power is way down but cameras are good joe we've got about 30 seconds tell everybody where they can get your book how they can learn more about your work well again i'm hoping to have an emotional conduit and better conversations in our country about the humanity behind the badge it's available on amazon uh barnes and noble uh and many uh big bookstores around uh, but you probably get it online pretty easy it's also available on kindle and you know i hope it makes a difference because um i really got sparked to to do this work with kate uh to to make a difference in our society well joe i'll tell you what i have multiple copies of it i'm sending it to friends uh, family i believe it is a must read for 
anyone in America, anyone in this country that really wants to know the truth about what law enforcement, the lives of law enforcement officers are all about. I commend you for your work. I really appreciate your candor and your willingness to share your work with us today, Joe. Thank you. Thank you so much. We've come to the end of another episode of Provocative Enlightenment. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed our show and will join us again next week, same time and same place. And do tell your friends. Let's have them join us as well. Okay, until next time. Of course, you're going to buy Shots Fired, and you're going to read this book, and you're going to send me your comments and thoughts on it. So until then, wherever you are in the world, remember, believing in yourself always matters. Provocative Enlightenment has been brought to you by Progressive Awareness Research and other sponsors. Provocative Enlightenment is a syndicated show and appears on other networks. For a schedule of showtimes, visit ProvocativeEnlightenment.com. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor, write to Eldon at EldonTaylor.com.